Harish. Okay. Good. Uh, share screen. Let's do this. Great. Okay. So we have our first uh, invited speaker today, Harish van Dedem from Astron and the University of Groningen. And uh, as he will be giving an update of uh, stellar and planetary science at low frequencies. Um, feel free to take it away, Harish. All right. Thanks, Joe. And um, um, it's pretty exciting to be uh, at the science at low frequencies, although it's virtual. So uh, uh, let's see how this goes. Uh, can I, I, I hope everyone can see the screen, which I'm scared, sharing, right? Yes, sir. Okay, good, all right. Okay, so I'm gonna be uh, kind of giving an overview talk about um, what we can do at low frequencies about stars and uh, planets to study stars and planets. And um, I mean, the, the disclaimer here is that when I say low frequencies, I just arbitrarily put a cutoff at like 300 megahertz or something. Um, it, in, in some sense it's arbitrary, but it's also practical in that a lot of the new results are coming uh, from the new instruments, which are all operating around 150 megahertz and lower. So um, it's kind of a handy uh, cutoff to have. So there's a lot of stuff happening at higher frequencies I won't be talking about. Uh, it's gonna be just concentrated on, uh, you know, wavelengths longer than a meter or something. Okay. Um, so I just wanna jump in here, but set the scene coming from the basic physics um, uh, and that has to do with the emission mechanism. So uh, when we talk of, you know, stars, planets, or, you know, in general radio emission, I have two options. You can have coherent or incoherent emission. Uh, what's nice at working at low frequencies is that for all practical purposes, the incoherent branch is not that important. Uh, and the reason for that is the kind of sensitivities we have, um, uh, if you look at a Milijansky source or something, a 10 parsec, you know, a radius the size of Jupiter, uh, at 150 megahertz, then the brightness temperature is 10 to the 13 Kelvin. So, uh, you know, the kind of sensitivities we're reaching, we're not gonna be looking at incoherent. And that actually greatly simplifies interpretation. So you only have coherent emission to worry about. And there you have two options in non-relativistic plasma. Uh, this plasma and cyclotron emission. So plasma emission happens at the local plasma frequency. Um, and so you get a direct measurement of the electron density uh, because the plasma frequency just depends on the electron density. And in cyclotron emission, the emission happens at the, uh, at the cyclotron frequency. So you get a direct measurement of the magnetic field. So they're incredibly powerful because you get these direct measurements if you can tell whether you're looking at plasma or cyclotron emission. Uh, and most of the low frequency detections are gonna fall in one of these two categories. And even among this, uh, cyclotron emission is kind of favored at low frequencies for very high brightness temperatures, just because its growth rate is so high as a lot of the detections you'll see are, are, are almost surely coming from cyclotron emission. Uh, and if you want a few more details of what is uh, of specific application to low frequencies, uh, then I encourage you to read, uh, uh, read the paper which came out this year, uh, which I authored. Uh, so this just sets the scene that we're talking of either plasma or cyclotron frequency. Now, in terms of the objects we are studying, you can go all the way from uh, something really big like sun-like stars uh, and all the way down the mass and temperature scale, and you go all the way down to planets, Jupiter, and of course I can even add an Earth here, but you know, in all likelihood, ground-based arrays will not be detecting emission from the Earth directly, uh, Earth-like planets directly. So I kind of stopped at Jupiter here. Uh, and so the general uh, image I wanted to have in mind is you can either have something which is sun-like, which is the kind of emission that comes from the sun, uh, it's more likely to be bursty plasma emission or something planet-like where the emission comes from a region with, without a very dense corona like the sun has. It's, it's like a tenuous plasma, but highly magnetized. So strong magnetic fields. And then I would call that planet-like, you know, it's just a phenomenological handle to say something is sun-like or planet-like. And, and the planet-like emission is most likely cyclotron emission. Uh, and the transition happens somewhere in low mass stars, the so-called M dwarfs. Um, and you know, the, the transition is not binary. It's it, the, the, this kind of a, you know, sl slow turnover from sun-like to planet-like behavior in these objects. Now I'm gonna start a little bit uh, with the sun-like uh, emission, but uh, I'm gonna focus most of the talk on the planet-like uh, just because we just have more data there because cyclotron emission is just so bright and easier to detect. Um, so here's a typical scenario where you get radio emission from a sun-like star, where you have a violent release of energy in a flare. 
Uh, and sometimes there's a large mass of plasma that's ejected in a so-called uh, coronal mass ejection. Uh, the shock front of the plasma gives rise to a characteristic radio burst called a type two burst. Uh, I'll, I'll show you what it means very soon. There's also extremely high energy particles. So these are relativistic beams of particles that are shot out uh, and that gives rise to a very characteristic radio burst. And both of these are extremely important uh, because there's a, they're, they, they directly determine the space weather around exoplanets. Um, so for instance, these coronal mass ejections can strip away a lot of the atmosphere of a planet. So that's like a vital input to, to model um, the atmosphere of a planet. And the high energy particle beams are also important because they affect a lot of uh, atmospheric chemistry. For instance, we know that ozone chemistry is affected by these relativistic beams. So um, that's very important. Now. The fun thing about radio is that radio has some, uh, what I would say is primacy in actually determining the space weather conditions because uh, you can see the flare in optical light, but it doesn't tell you if there has been a relativistic beam or there has been a mass plasma ejection. You, you really need a radio signature to figure, figure out that that's what is happening. So you get these kind of characteristic bursts uh, from the sun, which have these kind of uh, structures in time frequency plane. And, and I think the most interesting um, for kind of extrasolar applications right now is, is so-called type three bursts, which are these really second long uh, rapidly, uh, uh, there's a rapid frequency sweep and it lasts just a second. Uh, and they trace the, uh, the beams, which I spoke about, the relativistic beams. Or you can, can have these kind of slow drifting type two bursts shown in green here, um, where these basically trace the shocks which are going out uh, in, the, in, in the corona of the star. And both of these are from the plasma mechanism. And uh, people have looked for uh, people have looked for this kind of emission. And the upshot is that you know we we basically haven't been able to find this kind of emission outside the solar system. And I'll say a little bit about this a little later. Uh, but that's the upshot in terms of the observational um, results right now. Now, if you go to planet-like behavior where you have this tenuous Plasma, uh, tenuous plasma, and we call them magnetospheres because they're completely the dynamics are completely dominated by the magnetic field. Uh, then the bench, the kind of a poster child for that is is Jupiter. So Jupiter has uh, a strong magnetic field, about 15 Gauss on the surface. It's stronger than the Sun's global magnetic field, and it has a very tenuous plasma around it, um, and it is an intense source of cyclotron emission. Um, and so what's happening in this system is uh, uh, the emission is being powered not by some kind of outward propagating shock or, or a beam, but the emission is actually being powered by some kind of a differential motion between the magnetic field and the plasma. So once, uh, so for instance, Jupiter is rotating and, and if the plasma fails to rotate with, with the planet, then there is a relative velocity between the plasma and, and the magnetic field. And, and you all know from electrodynamics that the resistance force on the plasma. And so this leads to uh, acceleration of the plasma. And in Jupiter, it sets up a huge billion ampere um, current system. Uh, and that is what is powering the radio emission. Um, uh, and it's not just the radio emission, uh, the same electrons which emit in the radio also cause aurora, which you see in the inset here in, in, in the UV and optical. So these are electrons flowing along the magnetic field lines towards the poles and emitting radio waves by uh, cyclotron emission. And, and the nice thing there is once you measure the frequency of emission, you know the magnetic field at the emitter because it's cyclotron emission and the emission frequency only depends on the magnetic field, um, uh, at least for non-relativistic electrons. Um, another way you can get this V cross B force because of uh, differential motion is if you have a satellite uh, which is going around um, the central body. So in this case, let's say uh, uh, IO is a huge source of uh, this kind of radio emission where IO is going around Jupiter and it's essentially creating that differential, uh, the plasma around IO, which is tied to IO is not co-rotating with the Jupiter's magnetic field. So there's that extra V cross B force and IO can actually induce um, emission from Jupiter by accelerating plasma along this flux tube, which is connecting IO and Jupiter. Uh, and so the expectation is the same kind of thing will happen from with a low mass star with a strong magnetic field and a planet instead of Jupiter and Io. So those are the kind of the planet-like emission um, paradigm which I spoke about. Um, and you know, both of these sun-like and planet-like are based on our understanding of solar system, of course. So they're just useful benchmarks to have. Uh, so here's an example of what planet-like emission looks like from Jupiter. So this is again, frequency and time. 
uh, and what you're seeing in the color scale here or the gray scale is, is just emission intensity. Uh, and the fun thing here is uh, this line here, the, the kind of a shaded red, red curve is actually what you predict uh, based on the beaming geometry of the emission and the position of IOs, right? So you can kind of see how you can separate out the emission into that induced by a satellite and that just induced by the rotation of Jupiter, like kind of a secular emission from Jupiter itself. And the hope is we do things like this to exoplanets and actually try to detect exoplanets by the emission they induce uh, uh, around their host stars, just like IO is in, in inducing emission around Jupiter. Now, so you can basically put all this together into um, kind of a wish list, which I hope we, you know, we can uh, uh, we can work towards um, in in the low frequency space. And I mean, this is the list I, I, I came up with. But you know, if people have other ideas, I would like to hear about it because uh, I might have biases in terms of scientific interest. Um, so the first one uh, is actually to detect this type two and type three bursts from a sun-like stars. And we've not been able to do that yet, but there's good indication that we should be sensitive. The only issue is we need to go to high time resolution to be able to detect these bursts. And this is gonna be a huge deal because we'll be able to actually make realistic models for space weather around exoplanets and you know try to even start modeling atmospheric chemistry based on how much relativistic, uh, uh, how much relativistic beam injection there is in, uh, around these planets from their host stars. Um, the second wish list I would say is, is what I call magnetospheric emission from cool dwarf stars. So this is kind of the planet-like emission, but it's coming from really low mass stars. So think about very cold M dwarfs. Uh, think about uh, things like the TRAPPIST-1 system, which, um, which has you know, a, a lot of terrestrial planets around it. Uh, so kind of see, to, to see Jupiter-like emission or, or planet-like emission from these objects. Uh, the third, point comes down to uh, what I had to say about the uniqueness of radio observations to measure magnetic fields. Um, and it's now pretty clear that if you go to very cold brown dwarfs or even gas giant planets or even Earth-like planets, uh, radio emission is probably going to be the only way to measure the magnetic fields of these objects. And the magnetic fields are extremely important in, in determining their atmospheric properties, as we know from the Earth's magnetic field, which protects us from storms from the sun. Uh, and so you want to constrain the dynamo models which are predicting these fields and you need to come down to sort of the 100 to tens of Gauss regime where uh, many of these cold brown dwarfs and planets uh, magnetic fields are supposed to land. Uh, and if you just calculate the cyclotron frequency for this kind of magnetic fields, you end up in the, you know, the low radio frequency regime. Uh, and so that is a huge niche area where we can make, uh, a, 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 you know, a significant contribution to uh, exoplanets and uh, exoplanet science and brown dwarfs. Uh, of course, star planet interaction, which I just spoke about, just modeled on the Jupiter IO system, because uh, you know this is going to be a nice way to detect uh, kind of terrestrial planets around low mass stars, uh, which are hard to detect by radial velocity technique. Um, and the last three elements are, are, are basically um, uh, have to do with uh, uh, planets or new phenomena. So we want to actually find the direct auroral emission from from a planet like Jupiter in in an extrasolar setting, and you know that's going to be again massively revolutionary because that would mean that we can just directly detect the planets uh, just by pointing radio telescopes. And of course, you know the the ultimate goal here would be the long term goal to to be able to detect an Earth like planet just from its auroral radio emission, yeah, just from uh, you know the cyclotron emission. Uh, but of course, for that, we'll have to go to space because, you know, an Earth-like planet will have a magnetic field of a Gauss. And so you need to observe at like one or few megahertz uh, to be able to get there. And of course, there's always a possibility of new phenomena uh, because all of this is just based on solar system benchmarks. Okay, so that's kind of my wish list. And I just want to spend the rest of the talk running down with, you know, current state of the field and the kind of new results that are coming out. Uh, so in terms of the, 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 the star-like or the sun-like bursts, the type two and type three bursts, there's not been a whole lot of uh, concerted effort at very low frequencies. Uh, there have been some early efforts at slightly higher frequencies to look for these kind of uh, swept frequency structures in emission from, uh, uh, from nearby stars. Uh, and you know most of these observations were made of you know anomalously active flare stars, so you know they're probably not very representative of sun-like stars. But nevertheless, the, the upshot is that we do see some you know fast drifting bursts 
which are reminiscent of type three bursts from the sun, uh, the, the bursts which are created by these relativistic plasma beams, uh, like shown here on the left. Um, and you also see these slow drifting you know, structures as shown on the right here uh, from, uh, you know, from flare stars. I, I believe that the right one is from AD Leo. I, I think both of them are from AD Leo. Um, but you know, nothing really convincing uh, to say that this is for sure a type two or a type three burst. Uh, for example, in the right, you actually have the uh, you know, reverse frequency sweep, right? So the frequency is going up instead of down, uh, which you expect if a shock is propagating through the corona. Um, so the upshot is you know, the, uh, no definitive indication of you know, this kind of burst. Uh, um, but if you actually go through some numbers, which I, uh, which I did this year uh, in a paper, in a short paper, um, and try to calculate what is the cumulative burst above some flux threshold, and this is for type three bursts, the short one, one second duration bursts, which um, indicate the presence of relativistic beams in, in the corona. Uh, and then if you just plot it as a function of you know, your uh, distance from the earth, um, at some large distance, you know, you're, you're kind of going to saturate because, you know, one prescription I put in here is that there's a maximum brightness temperature limit that comes from theory uh, to these kind of bursts. So your cumulative distribution goes up and then kind of saturates at some distance. And you can, you know, the three curves are for three different, you know, detection thresholds. Uh, and the N star here just tells you the number of, you know, stars uh, uh, which are capable of producing these kind of bright bursts. Um, and you kind of see that if, if you reach like, you know, even tens of Milijansky sensitivity, uh, you're talking of tens to hundreds of, you know, so in that range, a few tens to hundreds of events uh, per sky per day, which is within reach of, you know, a large survey with the instruments we have. Uh, so my expectation is that, you know, this space is probably going to get opened up uh, in the coming few years. Uh, and so I'm pretty excited to see what comes out of um, the existing uh, facilities at, at low frequencies. Um, okay, so I want to move to uh, from uh, I want to move to uh, uh, kind of these red dwarf kind of stars because a lot of observational um, data and uh, observational results are basically coming pouring in right now in 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 in, in this uh, in this kind of mass regime, and so it's becoming pretty interesting to actually uh, study the uh, what's happening in these stars. So. We actually spent a whole lot of time at low frequencies just trying to get detections, like struggling for sensitivity. And I think the field is now at a point where you know, we are getting detections and we are going into deeper study uh, and to you know, kind of fulfill that promise of um, low frequencies to this kind of science. Okay, so um, just an interesting historical note, uh, the whole thing of you know, radio stars or radio emission from stars started off in the 60s and 70s uh, with some early detections, and I say, you know, quote and you know, detections in kind of quotes because these were single dish telescopes, uh, small bandwidth observations, and in many of these cases, it's unclear if the author saw interference or actually emission from the stars. Uh, some of it is for sure interference um, because we haven't seen bursts that magnitude since uh, with interferometers. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, some of them are probably genuine bursts, but it, it did set up the field, right? Uh, it did show that radio stars exist, you know, stars can be bright radio emitters, and the authors, you know, the, the, these early detections were about 10 to the 17 elks per second per hertz. Um, more recently, uh, we've had, you know, more systematic surveys, and I just highlight two results here. So one of them is from Willatson and Hallinan in 2019, where they had uh, kind of a white, ultra-wide bandwidth survey, uh, and with the VLA, and so they also had the you know the one meter system on the VLA, uh, and they did end up seeing you know these kind of circularly polarized bursts uh, from extremely active red dwarf stars. So these are very active flare stars like AD Leo, UV SETI, these kind of stars. These are not like your prototypical quiescent stars. So these stars are known to have extreme levels of activity, um, you know, uncomparable to you know just the general field population. On the right here is, 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 is kind of the first breakthrough that came at very low frequencies, like at 150 megahertz in, with recent instruments. And uh, that's from the MWA. So um, <clears throat> the kind of technique they were using is to say, okay, I'm gonna do a before and after kind of, you know, uh, uh, a comparison of, you know, on off kind of comparison you've seen in optical transients because this emission is very um, uh, time variable. So uh, you can actually do you know, what you, you would do with an optical transient or even a radio transient. 
Um, and the trick they had was to look at Stokes V, which is circularly polarized emission, because it's just simpler to calibrate uh, data and make you know deep maps in Stokes V. Uh, it's harder in Stokes I. And so you do see, you know, here's the detection of UV SETI uh, at you know 10 to the 14 ergs per second per hertz. That's kind of the energy range here. So we've really come down three orders of magnitude in sensitivity, and we are you know beginning to see all of these bursts. So uh, these were some of the I would say earlier, uh, kind of early breakthrough with, uh, with modern instruments. Um, we've been involved in something similar with LOFAR. So here's the first kind of breakthrough we had where uh, we are looking at, um, instead of pointing at known extremely uh, active stars, we just said, you know, we're just gonna go and look for uh, any Stokes we source in, 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 a, in a survey that's going on with LOFAR. And so it's a blind survey. So you just really get an unbiased view of the population out there. So here's the first detection we had. It's a you know, red dwarf star called GG1151. You see it in one exposure. This is an exposure taken about a month later and you know, it's gone. So that's good. That means that uh, it is variable as you would expect. Or, um, and the insects here are again, Stokes V, circularly polarized images. So, uh, so we can see the star in both you know, Stokes I and V because <clears throat> there's been a lot of time spent uh, with, within the survey collaboration to get you know, the calibration right in Stokes I to basically hit theoretical sensitivity limits where you know, uh, the survey fields have sensitivity, uh, RMS noise of about 70, mi 70 microjansky. So we're really going down to the sub millijansky population and all of these stars are beginning to now pop up. So we are beginning to detect them in larger numbers. Now this particular star was very interesting because it was absolutely quiescent by any measure. Uh, it had no detectable chromospheric activity, no detectable uh, uh, H alpha, um, uh, uh, no detectable H alpha signature, for instance. Uh, it was extremely slowly rotating. Uh, so its rotation period is 130 days. For comparison, the sun does a rotation in about a month. Um, so it was very curious to see why this was such a bright radio source, even though it did not fit all the uh, expected, um, uh, uh, all, all the expectations of what uh, radio bright stars were. Uh, so I don't have time to go into the detail, but we did kind of an exhaustive analysis of, uh, you know, both phenomenologically and even based on first principles theory. Uh, and the only known emission mechanism which uh, fit, you know, which could fit the bill, so to say, was to have this emission not uh, actually created by a star planet interaction, the kind of Jupiter IO system, which I spoke about. Uh, and, two minute you know, warning, Harish. I'm sorry? Two minute warning. Two minutes. Okay, got it. Uh, and so, you know, that, that was kind of a very nice result where, you know, we could actually uh, use these kind of observations to get at some cool science. Now, since then, we have gone to like 20 plus and counting detections. And uh, uh, there's a paper that's going to come out led by Joe. And again, I don't have time to go into it. But the general point I want to make here is that we are trying to, we are kind of finding this quiescent population, which uh, the emission doesn't seem to be correlated with any known activity indicators of the star. So there's something new going on here. Uh, and you know, we're kind of uh, you know, going into this new space where we are uh, discovering new phenomena. Uh, some other things I just want to throw out here. Uh, we can now have the sensitivity to do deeper study of emission physics. So here's another paper led by Joe uh, coming out. Um, uh, it's under review right now, where you see this kind of mottled you know, wavy structures in the dynamic uh, time frequency space. Uh, is very reminiscent of what you actually see from uh, Jupiter's emission. Uh, so we are actually going down into the, you know, kind of the microphysics of emission uh, with the data that's coming in. Um, another result I want to highlight, which I want to have time to go into, is was led by a summer student at Astron, Ivy Davis, um, where you know the idea was we we could take these kind of Zeeman Doppler imaging maps to know because then it gives us the uh, a sense of what the magnetic field in the star is, and then we can fit to that the radio emission we observe and and you know the theory of of the emission geometry uh, and the emission mechanism from just from theory. You put the two together and you can actually work out a whole lot. You can work out the location of the radio emission, the size of the closed field corona and the coronal density. And that's gonna be huge and vital inputs uh, to actually model the winds of these stars and you know, space weather in exoplanets. Okay, so I wanna say a little bit about, uh, go down to the planetary scale in the last minute or two I have. Um, uh, and the idea here, of course, is to you know, go down to low frequencies so we can actually go down to very low magnetic field strength. So here's just a prediction of magnetic field strengths. 
Uh, and you can see that if you're talking of, you know, one to 10 kind of Jupiter mass objects or, or, or even 20 Jupiter mass brown dwarfs, uh, you, your fields are, you know, roughly around 100 Gauss or even lower. So you want to be at very low frequencies because uh, uh, the cyclotron emission of these objects are going to be at low frequencies. Um, so uh, this space was kind of closed observationally because we never had a detection of a brown dwarf at, at low frequencies. Uh, and that's kind of changed this year um, where we have the first radio discovery of a, of a brown dwarf. And it, this the cherry on the cake here was that uh, this was this object was discovered directly in the radio, like it was not a known ground dwarf. And we do that by looking for, you know, Stokes V sources. So this is Stokes I, Stokes V, and you look in Aladdin there, there's absolutely nothing there, right? So we know it's not a star, it has to be a much colder object. Uh, and this object turned out to be a brown dwarf. Um, so that's nice. That means that we have now made inroads into that space there, where we can start testing dynamo models in, in sort of the planetary scale strength regime. Okay, the last thing I want to do in a minute I have left uh, is uh, actually go down further in mass to um, exoplanets. Um, <clears throat> so this slide kind of shows you uh, the predictions of the flux density on the y-axis and the frequency. And each triangle here is like a different exoplanet, um, which was studied. And you know, this is just one study. There are a lot of people who have done theoretical models of how bright they should be. Uh, and on the right here, uh, vertically I have a whole list of people who have cut their teeth on, you know, trying to go after this, uh, these kind of objects and try to detect them in the radio. And uh, the, the upshot is we have some, we're at a point where we have some tantalizing glimpses of, of a detection, uh, but no completely secure detection yet. So it, I think this coming year is gonna be super interesting to see, uh, uh, you know, if, if you actually get to the big prize, which is, uh, the first radio detection of a, of a, of an exoplanet aurora, for example. Uh, so I just want to highlight a couple of new, uh, you know, recent results here. Uh, so um, there's a paper in press by Turner et al. where um, they kind of detect tentative evidence for bursts from Tau Bootis, which is a very famous planet, uh, and they have this technique where they don't do images, but they have like an on beam and two off beams. These are control beams on the sky and they're kind of recording dynamic spectra. So they don't have imaging in, in, uh, information, but they can, they can look at statistics in these beams to see if there, are, there is some emission, uh, which is beyond the noise and beyond the systematics modeled by the control beams, which you can attribute to the on beam uh, where the target is. Uh, and here's their dynamic spectrum of one of their observing runs where uh, you can see this black band here, which uh, is, is there, is very strong in the on beam and is either ab absent or very weak in the off beams. Uh, and the upshot of all of this, uh, you know, uh, statistical analysis gives you sort of three and a half is sigma uh, detection at very low frequencies. Um, and, you know, this would be extremely exciting uh, if it's confirmed, uh, especially with imaging observations, because uh, that would mean that we have actually now gone down all the way in the mass range to exoplanets, not just brown dwarfs. Um, Arish, we're out of time as well, so you might have to speak. Oh, that's, my last, that's my last slide. <laughs> okay, the last thing I want to highlight here is, uh, here's another by Gaspin, uh, where the left shows me on the right, and they're looking at one of the exoplanet systems, and, you know, at Stokes V, you can kind of see the uh, how clean this map is, you, you kind of go down to Milijansky levels. And I want to highlight this because if you look at the predictions here, you know, the upshot is you want to be in the Milijansky regime somewhere here, right? So you want to get to Milijansky and sub Milijanskys at, you know, 10 megahertz or tens of megahertz. Uh, and, and this data, I believe, is at around 40 or 50 megahertz. So uh, I think the coming year or two is going to be extremely interesting because we are uh, getting to very interesting sensitivities. Okay, so uh, I just have a bunch of conclusions here. I'll just leave it up here and take questions. Thank you, Harish. I will give you a virtual clap. <laughs> um, have we got any questions for Harish? Uh, you can feel free to raise your hand in the attendees section. There's some questions in the Q&A as well you can ask. I can either unmute you to allow you to speak if you'd like to ask a question. Um, Philippe uh, Zaka would like to ask a question. I'll allow you to talk now. Philippe, you just have to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can yes, hear you. Sure. Hello, Harish. Very nice talk. Uh, actually, it's not a question. It was just a very short, co a very brief comment in your uh, next to last uh, slide about Turner et al. Actually, the the uh, the band of emission that is around twenty five megahertz 
is not the emission that uh, we detected actually. The emission is made of bursts at lower frequency. This band is probably a systematics. Oh, the, emission, okay. The, okay. The, emission, the emission is not visible in the dynamic spectrum. It's a series of weak bursts uh, below this band actually. Okay, I'm really sorry. I, no, I no, cannot... no, no problem. The, it's, uh, okay. the, 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 the talk was, uh, the words were, were okay, just the band, okay. not the emission. Okay, okay. So uh, right. this band I see here is not the detected emission. No, it, no, it's probably a systematic. Smallest the, the, burst detected based below. statistically by looking at the on and the off beams. Yeah, yeah. in the 15, 21 megahertz range, yes. All right, okay. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Philippe. And we've got time for one more question uh, before we have to move on. Uh, anyone online that would like to ask a question? Uh, Harish, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A section which you can answer in the following talk. Um, I might just ask one final question. Um, okay. With this uh, brown, this detection of the brown dwarf that you got, uh, what's the what's the uh, discovery rate you think you'll have there? Do you think this will be open up a brand new area to find tens or hundreds of these things? Or what's your feeling there in terms of finding brown dwarfs in low frequency sky? And will we be competitive with infrared people? Ah, oh, in terms of the numbers with, with no, I don't think we'll be competitive just in terms of numbers there. Uh, just from, you know, I mean, we, we looked at what 15 to 20% of of the survey and found one. Uh, so when the survey is done, we'll probably find like five, 10, you know, if you're lucky, maybe 20. I mean, it's hard to do poison statistics with one detection. Um, so no, we're never going to get to like hundreds uh, of brown dwarfs, which, you know, the Y satellite did, for example. And what's new in the radio is, you know, the radio emission uh, intensity doesn't really depend on the thermal emission intensity, right? So uh, you can, uh, at least the first discovery showed that you can find these things which are so cold that they haven't been found in the near infrared surveys. Um, and that was the nice thing about the discovery where, you know, we directly discovered something in the radio and it wasn't a known brown dwarf, even though there have been, you know, a lot of all sky surveys, including the Y satellite. We, you know, one of the big things of Y's was to find all the nearby brown dwarfs. Um, so I think we'll, we'll, we probably have a shot at finding very cold objects, which are, you know, at the blurry line between planets and brown dwarfs. Um, the numbers are going to be, you know, 10, 20 optimistically, 5 to 10 kind of realistically uh, with the LOFAR survey itself, but it's never going to be in the hundreds with current instrumentation. Okay. Well, thank you, Harish. I really appreciate it. Yeah, different uh, biases means we might not find a different population in infrared people. That's cool. All right. Thank you for your uh, talk. Uh, I'll give you another virtual clap. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I just want to say that I want to stick around and uh, but I have to teach in 20 minutes. So I might have to leave. So it's not because I'm being rude or something. I just have to teach. And I also want to say that the talks which are coming up in the session are the kind of topics I deliberately didn't uh, highlight in the talk. Uh, I just don't feel that it's not important or something. It, I just did it, didn't put it in my talk because I know that uh, somebody else will do a much better job. At it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Harish. Could you stop sharing? Um... Uh, and now I just want to welcome Anton uh, from Dias and Trinity College uh, to start sharing his screen. Anton, are you there? Yeah. Great. If you just want to show your video as well, that might be nice as well. If you if you feel comfortable. Thank you. All right. So just share your screen. And um, as I, I did with Harish, I'll give you a two minute warning uh, when when your time is up. Uh, okay. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yep, and just uh, put in presenting mode. Excellent. Yep, we can see you. Yeah. Thanks. Take it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, my name's uh, Anton Feeney Johansson. Uh, I'm a PhD student in my fourth year, uh, studying in uh, the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies and Trinity College uh, in Ireland. Uh, so the topic of my talk is uh, detecting radio flares uh, from Recline T Tauri stars using LOFAR. Uh, so, the main topic of my research is uh, using uh, low frequency radio uh, to study uh, young stellar objects or YSOs, uh, which are stars in the process of formation. Uh, so, I'll just give you a quick overview of the star formation process. Uh, so, uh, stars form in regions of uh, dense molecular gas known as molecular clouds. Uh, and then regions within the molecular cloud uh, will uh, collapse under their gravity and start to form a protostar. Um, and then these stars, are the, are these protostars will start to accrete material from their surroundings. Uh, and uh, as this happens, they form an accretion disk and uh, by these bipolar jets or outflows. 
uh, over time, uh, the envelope surrounding them is uh, dispersed or accreted. Uh, and then eventually the uh, disc and jet uh, are dispersed as well. Uh, so the objects I'm going to be talking about are known as weak lines T Tauri stars, uh, are also uh, class three objects. Uh, so these are uh, low mass uh, young stars uh, which have finished accreting. Uh, and so uh, they should have little, if any, uh, accretion disk remaining around them. Uh, so most studies of star formation and YSOs are uh, generally done in infrared. Uh, and uh, usually in, when they're studied in radio, it's uh, at uh, gigahertz frequencies. Um, there hasn't been much done at uh, low frequencies, but there have been two YSOs previously detected uh, using LOFAR. Uh, so this object, uh, Tito, uh, there was a thermal emission detected from the jet um, of the of, or of the star, uh, and then and this object, uh, DG Tau, uh, we detected synchrotron emission uh, from shocks in the jet uh, of the star. Uh, so YSOs are known to be uh, uh, very magnetically active. Uh, and this is seen in. Uh, uh, or this is seen in uh, flaring activity in uh, X-ray and radio. Uh, so radio flare, uh, the radio flares uh, previously detected have um, generally been at uh, gigahertz frequencies, uh, and usually they've been uh, attributed to uh, incoherent uh, gyrosynchrotron emission. Uh, however, uh, not much has been done at uh, low frequencies. Uh, however, uh, main sequence stars, on the other hand, um, there have been uh, radio flares detected uh, at uh, low frequencies. Uh, or you heard a bit about this in the last talk. Um, but like uh, one example is you know, UV SETI, uh, which is a well-known uh, nearby flare star. Um, and there were four flares detected from this uh, 150 megahertz uh, using the uh, MWA. Uh, so the observations we did were carried out using LOFAR in the high band array, uh, so 110 to 190 megahertz. Uh, and the observations we have uh, were done uh, of the uh, Taurus Macro Cloud. Uh, so Taurus is, uh, or the Taurus Macro Cloud is a nearby a region of low mass star formation, uh, about 150 parsecs away. Uh, so we've uh, two observations from uh, 2013, uh, which originally were targeting uh, DG Tau and T Tau, which I uh, mentioned a couple of slides ago. Uh, however, we uh, also analyzed um, the fields uh, of the images uh, for emission from other YSOs, uh, since the field of view for LOFAR is quite large. Uh, and then we also have uh, observations from 2019 uh, which were part of the LOFAR two meter sky survey. Uh, and these observations uh, covered the entire uh, Taurus molecular cloud. Uh, so we compared the sources detected um, in these observations uh, with catalogs of uh, known YSOs uh, in the region. Uh, and when we did this, we found that uh, we detected uh, a flaring radio emission uh, from uh, two YSOs um, in this region. Uh, so the first object uh, we detected is uh, KPNO Tau 14. Uh, so this is a very low mass star, um, only about uh, 0.1 solar masses, uh, about a million years old. Uh, so uh, when we compare two observations uh, of uh, the region, uh, we see that in the 2013 observation, uh, we were able to detect emission, uh, but then it's uh, disappeared in the 2019 observation. Uh, so show it, no, this shows the transient nature of uh, this emission. Uh, and then also very interestingly, uh, the emission was uh, very highly circuit polarized, actually close to 100%. Uh, when, uh, we saw this when we looked at the Stokes V emission uh, from the object. Uh, so to learn more about the emission, uh, we uh, uh, divided the eight-hour observation uh, into 30-minute uh, time steps, uh, and then imaged each time step to um, go
got a lie curve of the flux density of the source. Uh, so you can uh, see uh, in this figure here clearly that we detected two large flares from the object. Uh, so the first flare being uh, very bright and very short, uh, less than half an hour. Uh, and then the second flare uh, is longer, about two hours, um, although not quite as bright uh, as the first flare. Uh, so the first flare, because it's actually because it's so bright, we were able to uh, divide it up further to get higher time resolution in the light curve. Uh, so we're able to divide it into uh, three minute time steps. Uh, and you see here uh, just how bright and short uh, the flare is. Uh, so it lasts about 15 minutes and peaks at uh, 28 milligansky. Uh, and you can see an animation here uh, of the flare over this half an hour. Yeah, it uh, goes up and or it increases and decreases in flux uh, very quickly. Uh, so uh, from the flux density uh, of the flare, we were able to calculate uh, the luminosity of the flare. And we see that is um, remarkably bright uh, at 10 to the 17 ergs per second. Uh, so for example, this is actually three orders of magnitude uh, brighter than the UV SETI emission, uh, which I mentioned previously. Uh, and then also we were able to calculate a brightness temperature of uh, 10 to the 15 Kelvin, again, uh, extremely high. Uh, so then the second object we detected is the calcium-4. Uh, so this is a higher mass uh, star, about 0.8 solar masses and half a million years old. Uh, so for this object, we actually have a uh, measurement of the magnetic field of the surface magnetic field of objects, and it's about two kilogauss. Uh, and we also actually have evidence, previous evidence of high magnetic activity. Uh, so uh, X-ray like flares and radio flares at gigahertz frequencies have been detected. Uh, uh, also, it's, interestingly, it's been shown to be uh, very heavily uh, covered in uh, sunspots, or about 80% uh, of its surface. Uh, so again, comparing two emissions, uh, these are about a month apart, uh, both from 2019. Uh, we see that it's clearly transient emission, um, and the emission seems to have disappeared uh, in this observation here. Uh, and again, uh, it's also very highly circularly polarized, although not quite as high as the previous source, but still about 70%. Um, so yeah, again, the plotted a light curve of the flux density by dividing the observation up into uh, 30 minute time steps. Uh, and then we detected two flares, um, both about five milijanskis. Um, so uh, not quite as bright as uh, the flares from the previous source, uh, but still very uh, impressive. Uh, and when we calculate the luminosities and brightness temperatures, we still see that they're still very high, about 10 to the 17 ergs per second, about 10 to the 13 Kelvin in uh, brightness temperature. Um, so uh, after seeing all this, the main question we want to know is uh, what's uh, causing the emission or what's the emission mechanism? So given the very high brightness temperature and the high circular polarization, uh, we know it has to be a coherent emission mechanism. It can't be incoherent. So we have two options then, a either plasma emission uh, or electron cyclotron maser emission, also known as ECM emission. Uh, so the first possibility, plasma emission. Uh, so, the, so this uh, emission mechanism is caused by uh, the injection of hot plasma into a surrounding cooler ambient plasma. So this is seen in example, for example, in the sun in type two and type three bursts. Uh, however, for uh, the emission that uh, we detected, it doesn't seem very likely um, since for typical uh, coronal temperatures and uh, parameters for weak line T-Tauri stars, uh, you would only, uh, ex you, it seems we can, you'd only be able to reach about uh, 10 to the 11 uh, Kelvin in brightness temperature, uh, which is a lot lower than the emission that we detect. So given that uh, plasma emission doesn't seem possible. Um, 
it, we uh, determined that it's probably uh, ECM emission, uh, since uh, this uh, mechanism is generally uh, more efficient, so you can expect uh, higher brightness temperatures and, uh, and uh, polarization. Uh, so um, this uh, mechanism is generated by uh, relativistic electrons um, uh, emitting at uh, the local cyclotron frequency in uh, the source region of the emission. Uh, so uh, interestingly, this actually means we can calculate the magnetic field in the source region. Uh, so uh, for uh, low far high band frequencies, this means we would expect uh, a magnetic field of about uh, 40 to 60 gauss in the source region, um, although it could actually be lower, about uh, 20 to 30 gauss if it was second order harmonic emission. Uh, and for lit calcium 4, uh, because we uh, know the surface magnetic field strength, uh, we can actually estimate uh, the distance from the star that uh, this uh, magnetic, magnetic field would correspond to. Uh, so, as uh, if we assume that, uh, I mean, or if we approximate the magnetosphere as a magnetic dipole, um, that magnetic field uh, strength would come out as uh, about a distance of uh, three to four uh, stellar radii uh, from the star. Uh, so, in order to generate. Um, Two minute warning, Anton. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, in order to generate the. Um, uh, sorry, in order to generate the ECM emission, uh, the most likely uh, way of doing that seems to be a, a co-rotation breakdown. Uh, so where there's a breakdown of co-rotation uh, between uh, plasma orbiting the star uh, and the magnetosphere of the star. Uh, so this is seen, for example, in the sun, um, or, sorry, in, or seen, for example, in Jupiter and the decametric uh, meter em emission. Uh, so uh, this would, uh, this uh, explanation uh, makes a lot of sense for uh, the objects we see since they're uh, fast rotating and this explanation uh, uh, depends on, or is powered uh, by rotation. Uh, and then also weak line T Tauri stars are thought to have uh, very high mass loss rates, uh, which would provide a source of the uh, uh, plasma around the star. Um, although. Uh, while that is the most likely explanation, um, another possible explanation, which would be very interesting if it was true, um, would be an interaction uh, with an orbiting exoplanet. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, Vidaldo and Donati in 2017 actually predicted uh, that a hot Jupiter orbiting a weak line T Tauri star uh, would generate a significant amount of uh, ECM emission at low frequencies. Uh, so, this would be due to uh, the stellar wind of the star uh, interacting with the uh, planetary uh, magnetosphere for the hot Jupiter. Uh, and for a star at 150 parsecs, it would generate about uh, 6 to 24 milijanskis um, at between 18 and 240 megahertz, uh, depending on the um, magnetic field strength of the planet. Uh, however, there are a couple of issues. Um, obviously, uh, you need a, a hot Jupiter orbiting the star. Uh, and we don't know if that's the case for either of these objects. Uh, and then also you, the uh, planet would need to have a very high magnetic field of uh, 40 to 60 gauss. So in conclusion, uh, we were able to detect uh, uh, flares from uh, two uh, T Tauri stars. And this is the first time we've detected uh, flaring radio emission from YSOs at low frequencies. Uh, and it seems that uh, ECM emission uh, is the most likely ex uh, emission mechanism for these flares. Uh, so uh, in, for, in terms of future work, uh, we're still uh, looking at some of the observations uh, from 2019. So we hope maybe to detect some more YSOs in Taurus. Uh, and then we've also actually have observations of Perseus, the Perseus molecular cloud uh, which is another uh, region of star formation nearby. Um, so uh, thank you for your attention uh, and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Anton. Very interesting stuff. Uh, we've got a question from Sophie. I'll just unmute you, Sophie. Uh, 
Uh, you're now free to talk. You just have to unmute yourself, sir. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I'm a solar physicist. Okay. Um, we are usually using radio and X-ray emission from players um, to have better constraint on the mechanisms and to explain what we see. Uh, you mentioned that YSOs sometimes are known to uh, also emit an X-ray, and I was wondering if there is any observation of simultaneous X-ray and radio flares for YSOs, and if it doesn't exist yet, how uh, do you think it's possible to coordinate observation from, for example, LOFA and new star in X-ray to kind of get this kind of data that would be very interesting to complete um, these kind of observations? Um. No, well, uh, um, yeah, unfortunately, there's no um, simultaneous observations um, of uh, low frequency radio and x rays. Um, I'm not sure about there might be, actually, I think there are simultaneous observations actually for uh, at gigahertz frequencies um, with x ray. And they have seen, um, I think they have seen uh, flaring. Uh, or simultaneous flaring in X-ray and um, radio before. Um, but it would be very interesting to do the same at uh, low frequencies and see if there's any correlation uh, between X-ray uh, emission and um, low frequency radio emission. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. Um, I'll just maybe ask the last question, Anton. Uh, you've done some excellent work there with the, uh, splitting up the emission in time. Have you considered the spectral structure of this emission? Have you considered uh, looking at what kind of spectral response uh, the emission has? Uh, yeah, um, we are done that. Uh, I didn't put in the talk, uh, unfortunately, because of the time. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, we did it. Uh, uh, so I did uh, try uh, splitting up emission in uh, frequency and time to see if we could see any uh, sort of change in the uh, spectral uh, properties um, of the emission. Uh, I know for one of the flares in uh, like calcium-4, it did seem possibly uh, to be some uh, frequency drift where the frequency was going from low frequencies to high frequencies. Um, Whereas the issue is that you very low signal to noise um, at that stage. Uh, so it is yep. a bit difficult to tell. Okay. Yeah, no, totally. I'm happy to discuss this further as well. Um, we, as we've done in the CR dry paper, we've done something similar. So we might be able to compare notes. Anyway, so thank you, Anton, for your talk. I really appreciate it. Excellent stuff. There's some questions for you in the Q&A uh, session as well, if you'd like to answer in the next talk. If you just don't mind, uh, if you stop sharing your screen for me. Thank you. All right, um, now I just want to uh, welcome uh, uh, Yun Tian to take us on to the next uh, talk about early time search for uh, coherent radio emission from short GRBs using the MWA. Would you just like to uh, unmute yourself and share your screen? Yeah, great. Can you hear me? Feel free to take it away and I'll just give you a two minute warning again, okay? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm a PhD student from Kent University. And uh, my project is uh, using a uh, medicine wild field array to search for the uh, pumped radio emission from short gamma burst. So uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, what gamma burst uh, by definition. So uh, gamma burst is just the gamma pulses uh, with short durations from cosmological distance. And uh, in the top plot, there is a distribution of the duration of uh, gamma burst. Uh, from this by mode distribution, we can categorize the gamma burst into long gamma burst and short gamma burst. In the bottom two panels, uh, this gives an example of the long gamma burst in the left panel and example of the short gamma burst in the right panel. Yep. So uh, apart from the duration difference, the models of the long gamma burst and the short gamma burst is also different. So for long gamma burst, we believe is uh, from the uh, supernova explosion. So the explosion will launch a jet and uh, 
and it will create internal shocks and external shocks. So we can observe gamma burst along with uh, other uh, emissions like optical X-ray and radio emission. But the long gamma burst is not the focus of my project because uh, the dense uh, medium surrounding the explosion will uh, prevent the radio emission propagating from the uh, burst, uh, burst site. So here is a model of the short gamma ray burst, and uh, it's uh, produced by the measure of a battery system, usually a neutron star and neutron star battery system. And we can say, uh, apart from the uh, gamma emission, it also produces X-ray, optical, and the radio emission. And what I'm looking for is the pump radio emission. Here is a few examples to show what the pump radio emission looks like. The left plot shows a few examples of the fast radio burst, and the right plot is uh, uh, the pulse from some pulsars. So both of these uh, radio pulses, pulses are what I'm looking for. So uh, we have uh, theoretical models that predict a uh, pump radio emission from a uh, short from gamma, short gamma burst, and we lead observations to confirm this prediction. And if we uh, divide a uh, star measure into four phases, we can label it by A, B, C, D. So in phase A, it's prior to the measure, and uh, just in the at the moment, just prior to the major interaction between the magnetospheres, it's likely to spin up the magnetar and to reactivate the pulsar emission mechanism. In phase B, so uh, so when the when a jet is launched by the major, it uh, collides into the interstellar medium. It's also likely to produce the radio emission. And if the major product is a magnetar, which is a supermassive geomagnetic field and rapid rotating uh, neutron star, it can also produce some uh, persistent radio emission. Finally, when the magnetar spin down and it cannot support its uh, gravitational uh, force, it will collapse to form a black hole. So in this uh, collapse process, it will also uh, produce a uh, radio emission. And here is the meth uh, method I'm using to uh, 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 search for the uh, radio emission for short gamma burst. Uh, in the bottom, I show how we uh, uh, do the follow-up observation. So first, when a gamma burst trigger a satellite like Fermi or Swift, it will send a light to the MWA. And so we can use the MWA, uh, use its electronic steering. So, which means it's very fast response to a point to the gamma burst uh, position. And we use the MWA because it has a uh, few uh, features that make it suitable for this uh, kind of task. So first, it has a large field of view. Uh, this uh, because the position of the gamma burst reported by Fermi and the Swift is, especially by Fermi, is very poor. So we need a large field of view to cover the position error. Second, uh, the MWA has uh, a trigger system uh, that can filter out unlikely events because we also got some other events that probably not jabbed. And thirdly, we have a voltage capture system and this is part of the future work, and I will talk about it later. And next, so uh, the MWA has performing the follow-up observation since uh, 2016, and until this year, uh, I selected a uh, line short database to do the data analysis because this line short database has some uh, decent image. So uh, most. Uh, here is an outline of my data processing. Uh, so for Fermi Jabbits and Swift Jabbits, I use two different processing methods. That's because 
Bemidja bit uh, has a much poor localization. So I can only search for the uh, radio transient candidates in the Jabi region. But for Swift Jabi, it has a much better localization. It can uh, the exact Jabi position and doing some uh, dispersion and uh, simulation. Here, uh, I'd like to show the results for this line short Jabi's. So in the left table, is the upper limits on the video emission obtained on different time scales. And I highlight two Jabi's. So one, one Jabi has the best sensitivity among the family Jabi's, and the other has the best sensitivity over the Swift Jabi's. And in the right plot, is the simulation uh, we did on the two swift jabbies. Uh, so basically, we simulated uh, a number of pulses and injected to our images, and we run our dispersion codes to say how many we can find. So if we uh, use the 90% detection efficiency say, as our uh, sensitivity, we can say for one of the jabbies, uh, the upper limit is around 100 Jansky milliseconds. And for the other one, it's around uh, 1500 Jansky milliseconds. Next, uh, we, get, we got some uh, upper limits and we want to use these upper limits to constrain the theoretical models. And among the line short jabbies, we only got one jabby that has a uh, redshift information. And this is the Jabi 190627A. And uh, the left plot is a uh, fitting of the X ray light curves of this uh, Jabi because it has a swift, it is a swift Jabi. So we have X ray observation and we can use the X ray light curve to fit in uh, the magnetar parameters. And so uh, the right plot is the comparison between our upper limits and the predicted radio emission. And it corresponds to the phase A of the measure. So in this plot, it's just uh, uh, prior to the measure. And uh, because this uh, emission mechanism is similar to the pulsar, so we use a vertical line to indicate the typical pulsar efficiency. And we can say if the if efficiency is um, uh, similar to the pulsar efficiency, our sensitivity is not enough to detect this emission. And next, we like to constrain uh, the emission and the, parameter the parameter parameters in phase B and phase C. And we didn't uh, constrain the phase D just because, uh, as we can see from the X3 net curve, uh, the magnetic activity probably uh, lasts up to 10 to 4 seconds. So our observation only lasts 30 minutes. So it's not, uh, it's unlikely to constrain the uh, uh, phase B in the uh, measure. But we can say uh, in the uh, uh, phase B, uh, we, the horizontal line is the, our upper limits, and the vertical line is uh, some typical value of the magnetic energy fraction. And we can say, uh, based on our upper limit, we can constrain the magnetic uh, energy fraction should be smaller than a few times 10 to minus four. And this is smaller than the typical value. Uh, the right plot is corresponds to phase C. And uh, this uh, emission is different from phase A and phase B because phase C is produced by a magnetar and is a uh, lot uh, one of burst is a uh, persistent emission. So we can use the upper limit derived from the 30 minute full observation. So we can say uh, it can, it's very close to the typical uh, pulsar efficiency, but still a uh, larger, still a lot enough to detect the radio emission. And uh, next, uh, we also uh, use the upper limit from the Fermi Jabis to constrain emission models. And because for the Fermi Jabis, we don't have the redshift emission, so we have to uh, 
plots that predict flags evolving with redshift. And uh, in both uh, uh, the, in both uh, plots, we can say uh, the horizontal line labeled by MWA short, this is the most sensitive limit from family jabbies, but they are not enough to detect the re predicted radio emission. And we also plotted two horizontal lines labeled by MWA BCS. This uh, type of observation is much more sensitive than the standard mode. And you can say, especially for the face be the right plot, it's uh, very promising to detect the predicted emission. Here is the comparison uh, for the uh, assist emission and our uh, deep limit. We can say, uh, although we don't uh, we didn't detect the radio emission, but we can use the upper limit to constrain the red shifts of this uh, sum of the short charges. Next, uh, I'd like to compare the MWA with some other radio telescopes that's also doing the same uh, radio emission search, uh, like LOFA and uh, SCAP. We can say, uh, now some, vert some vertical lines in the plot, it corresponds to the dispersion delay as different uh, frequencies. The red, the red points is the observations in, uh, in my project. And uh, I want to uh, mention that in this plot, the most sensitive uh, observation, it comes from a uh, low far. It's almost down to 10 to minus three uh, Janskripa beam. Uh, but uh, the most, uh, the fastest response, it comes from MWA, it's around uh, tens of seconds. And there are also a few points in the left part of this plot. Uh, These uh, this, uh, points, it represents instruments that's doing the all sky survey. So it's not like the pointed observation. So uh, MWA compared to the other pointed instruments is uh, not the most sensitive, but it's the fastest to catch the earliest radio emission from short gamma burst. And here is the future plane. So as I mentioned, the VCS system, it has a much better time resolution. It's a hundred microseconds compared to the half seconds of the standard mode. So this will uh, improve our sensitivity to this uh, narrow pulse signal. Uh, finally, it's a summary. So we got no detection of radio emission associated with the line short jabbies, but we can use this upper limits to constrain the parameter, the model parameters in the binary, binary uh, measure. So, and the VCS is uh, more promising in searching for the a coherent emission from short gamma bust. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Yun. A uh, very interesting talk about Georgia bees in the MWA. Uh, has anyone got any questions online? Anyone got any questions about GRBs or the BCS system on the MWA or this uh, rapid follow up? No, I just had, had one question. Um, so you want to quickly get on on this, obviously for the prompt emission, uh, but this relies on the algorithm from Swift, right, and predicting the correctly these are short GIBs. I'm just wondering what is your false false uh, uh, targeting rate, you know? So when Swift puts out an alert, how often uh, are you confident it's a short GIB? Are you 100% certain? Is it 90%? Or like how often do you uh, uh, get? That yeah, wrong? we have uh, thresholds. It should be at least 50% uh, to be a short. To be a GRB, but uh, most times it will be later be found a uh, long GRB. So we also need to check if it's a short one, a long one. Yeah, so you have contamination from a long GRB as well. Oh, mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, and so yeah, so have you uh, like so you, you? It's at least it's a 50-50 call essentially, is what you're saying. Uh, no, actually, uh, long GRBs are much much more common than short GRBs. So. Okay. Oh, so that changes the numbers again. All right. Yeah. Okay. 
interesting stuff. Anyone uh, last minute questions? No, if not, thank you again, Yon. And we'll just, uh, uh, I just ask you to stop sharing and I'll ask uh, Benali to start sharing. Her screen. Fantastic. All right, so Benali from uh, the NCRA is gonna give us a talk about what she's calling main sequence uh, pulsars, an exotic subset of magnetic, uh, magnetically massive stars. Um, feel free to take it away. I'll give you a two minute warning. You are audible. You're a little bit quiet, but I can hear you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Is it all right now? Yes, that's better. Okay. Hi, everyone. So today I'm going to talk about uh, a subset, a, a class of objects which have been named as main sequence pulsars. So this is the outline of my talk. So I'll start by giving you the basic information regarding this class of objects, which are uh, called main sequence pulsars, in short, MSPs. And then I will talk about how you can use this pulse emission to probe this class of objects. And finally, I will tell you about something which I am very excited about. So these are some surprises that we got in our low radio frequency observation of this main sequence pulsars. OK, so main sequence pulsars, they are early type stars or spectral type B or A. And they have large scale surface magnetic field, which are nearly, di nearly dipolar. And the magnetic field strength ranges between some hundreds of Gauss to tens of kilogauss. And they are called pulsars because they emit highly directed coherent radio emission, just like the pulsars, normal pulsars. And this pulse emission, they are produced near these magnetic polar regions. And they are emitted almost perpendicular to the magnetic dipole axis. And they have very high circular polarization, close to 100%. And this phenomenon, this pulse emission, they exhibit periodicity. And this period is same as the rotation period of the emitting objects, which are of the order of days. OK, so you are all familiar with uh, the lighthouse effect in case of the normal pulsar. So let me now, uh, let me now uh, tell you or explain you the lighthouse effect in case of the main sequence pulsars. So here, what I'm showing you here, this is the star, this is the dipole axis, this is the, these are the north and south magnetic polar regions, this is the observer, and these arrows represent the direction of emission of the radio emission, coherent radio emission. And as I said, they are directed almost perpendicular to the dipole axis, but because of the refraction, they got deviated in this way. So when the star is in this kind of a rotational phase, this pulse will be seen by the observer, which is what I have shown here. The dash curve represents the line of sight magnetic field. After that, this pulse will come into view, which is what I have shown here. And then after the relatively longer gap, this pulse will again be seen by the observer. And finally, this pulse will be seen by the observer. So basically, the typical uh, light curve of this pulse emission consists of two pairs of pulses which are seen near the rotational phases where the line of sight magnetic field is nearly zero. These are called the magnetic nulls. And each pair has one pulse coming from the south and one pulse coming from the north magnetic polar regions. And these can be distinguished because they have opposite circular polarization. Okay, so I haven't yet told you the very important information, which is the what is the emission mechanism behind. So emission mechanism is well known to be the electron cyclotron measured emission. You have already heard uh, a lot about it all in the previous talks. And it gives rise to radiation at a frequency proportional to the local electron gyro frequency. And in addition to these main sequence pulsars, these early type stars, this emission has also been observed from ultra cool dwarfs, planets like Jupiter, Saturn, Earth, etc. But these MSPs or main sequence pulsars, they are the only objects which have their own supply of energetic electrons, which is required for this process, and a highly stable magnetic field both of which ensures that the observed phenomena is highly regular. So you can predict when the pulse is going to be observed next. Okay, with that, now I'm going to the next part of my talk, which is how we can use the pulse emission, the CCME, as a stellar probe. So the first use that people have realized is, that is regarding the rotational period evolution. The principle is very simple. So if the star is spinning at a constant speed, then these pulses will always arrive the observer at the same rotational phases. And using this principle, the rotational period evolution of for two of the main sequence pulsars, which are CU Virginis and T13880, were uh, detected. By the way, CU Virginis was the first discovered main sequence pulsars, and it was discovered by Trigilio et al. in 2000. 
The second usage of ECME is regarding the estimation of plasma density. And ECME is sensitive to plasma density at the site of its origin, as well as the plasma density within the inner magnetosphere. Now, within a minute, I'll tell you what I mean by inner magnetosphere. So this is a very simplified diagram regarding the stellar magnetosphere. This represents the star and this is the arrow. This arrow represents the dipole axis. And these are the magnetic field lines. And you can see the field lines remain closed only up to a certain distance. And this region is called the inner magnetosphere. So inner magnetosphere is the region that contains all the closed magnetic field loops. And this is the densest part of the stellar magnetosphere. And this is the outer magnetosphere where the field lines have become open. And in between, we have a thin middle magnetosphere. And ECME is produced in this thin middle magnetospheric regions near the magnetic poles. So the principle for, is, for constraining the plasma density at the site of emission, which are somewhere here, using ECME is that the magnetoionic mode of ECME, whether it is in the extraordinary mode or ordinary mode, it depends on the ratio between the local plasma frequency to the local electron gyro frequency. So if you can identify the magnetoionic mode, you can, and because you know the plasma electron gyro frequency already from the observed frequency of emission, you can constrain the plasma density. And this was first used by Latour et al. in 2019. So now the question is how one can identify the magneto magnetoionic mode from observation. For that, I'd like to show you this figure. This is a cartoon diagram, by the way. It shows the ECME light curve for one full rotation cycle. And this is the extraordinary mode emission. This represents the ordinary mode emission or OMON. And you can see there are differences between the two light curves and differences lies in the circular polarization of the pulses. For example, here, when the line of sight magnetic field is changing from negative to positive, you will see the left circularly polarized or LCP pulse first, followed by the right circularly polarized pulse or the RCP. Whereas in case of the ordinary mode, it is just the opposite. So basically, if you have the information regarding the line of sight magnetic field, if you have the information about circular polarization, you can identify the magnetoionic mode and hence constrain the plasma density at the site of emission. One very important point here is that this whole chain of arguments assumes that after the ECM is produced, they undergo refraction and it made the ray deviated in a way that it goes away from each other. The ray which are produced at opposite magnetic poles, they get deviated away from each other. So this is the assumption that has been made when in this figure. So I'll come back to this point later again. Okay, so second use of ECME, as I said, that you can use ECME to estimate average density at the inner magnetosphere. So as I said, inner magnetosphere is the region which is the densest part of the stellar magnetosphere. So it, once ECME is produced, it has to pass through this region contain, that contains uh, dense plasma to reach the observer. And this is where it suffers refraction because refraction is a frequency dependent effect. Different frequencies arrive to observe at, observer at slightly different rotational phases. And this was explained by Trigilo et al. in 2011. Now we proposed a strategy to use these differences to obtain an average estimate of the density inside this inner magnetosphere. And we predicted that there will be a linear relation between this lag and this quantity lambda one square minus lambda two square if we observe over a small bandwidth. And observationally, this is confirmed as well. And these plots are, they represent this lag versus lambda one square minus lambda two square plot. And it contains data over a frequency from 550 to 800 megahertz. And these red points corresponds to the RCP pulse and these blue points correspond to the left, uh, LCP pulse, both of which are observed near, a, near the same magnetic null. So you can see that they are they nicely follow a straight line. But the important point is, point is that they have different slopes. Now the slope is the quantity that includes the dependence on the average density inside the inner magnetosphere. So now, now the fact that the slopes are different for the two pulses indicates that the average plasma density is different along different line of sight. So this is the first hint that ECME is not only sensitive to the density, but it is also sensitive to the plasma distribution. It became more clear when you observe over a wide range of frequencies. So we observe a set of MSPs over a frequency range of around 330 megahertz to around four gigahertz using the upgraded giant meter radio telescope and the very large area or the VLM. 
So I'm so we got many unexpected results, but I'm showing you only one of those results. So here, what I have plotted here are the peak flux density spectra for the four ECME pulses. So you can clearly see that the spectral shapes are different for the four pulses, and even the cutoff frequencies are not the same. So from this fact, we propose that this seemingly anomalous behavior that they are, even though this, they are the same pulse, but when observed at a different stellar orientation, it shows a different properties. We propose that these differences did not arise because of a, something different in the, at the site of origin, but rather because of the propagation effect. So, so it's not that people haven't realized that propagation effects is important for the CME. As I said, propagation effect have been proposed to cause this delay between different frequencies long back in 2011. But the problem is that in all the past treatment, it has been assumed that any refraction within the inner magnetosphere is negligible. So they all considered the refraction at the time of entering this inner magnetosphere from the site of origin. But the refraction that can happen because of density change within this inner magnetosphere is ignored completely. But there are analytical framework already that predicted that if a star has a misaligned impact and dipole axis, it will be more prominent. It predicted that there will be there can be overdense region within this inner magnetosphere and it is marked with this sharp gradient in density. And most importantly, this overdense region is not symmetric about the magnetic axis. And this can give rise to different properties uh, at different orientation of the star if the rotation and magnetic dipole axis are not aligned, which is the case for all, almost all the main sequence pulsars. So to overcome this limitation, we developed a 3D framework which incorporates the propagation effects that can happen within the inner magnetosphere as well. So, so we got some unexpected results, but I will now focus on only one of those results because that is the most relevant one for this talk. What I am showing you here in this plot are the ECME light curves for the frequency that satisfies this, uh, this uh, equality, the nu by nu max. Nu max corresponds to the magnetic field at this like the poles equal to around 0.2. The red and blue, it represents ECME pulses that are produced near the north and south magnetic polar regions. The top panel represents the ECME uh, right, light curve that we obtain when you consider the refraction within the inner magnetosphere. Whereas the bottom panel represents the uh, light curve in which uh, we have ignored the refraction within the inner magnetosphere. You can already see that they are, they are very different. But the most important difference lies in the sequence of arrival of these red and blue pulses. This, the bottom panel, as I said, is obtained when we, when this kind of a refraction is, if this kind of a deviation is valid, that they get deviated in a way that they go away from each other. But what I, we found that because of refraction within the inner magnetosphere, they can get deviated in the opposite manner as well. Now, this is an important, uh, important result because the sequence of arrival is what people use to estimate the, or the ident or to identify the magnetoionic mode and the magnetoionic mode this identification is used to constrain the plasma density at the site of emission so this means that if we do not account for propagation effect we may end up by making a wrong estimate of the plasma density so the take home message is that ECME is really a promising tool for the stellar magnetosphere but we really need to characterize its properties first. And that's what uh, we are continuing. Just two minutes, uh, yeah. Benali. Yeah, so the last part of my talk is about the low frequency surprises and it's obtained for the most widely known pulsar CU Virginis. We, for the first time, observed a star at 350 to 800 megahertz with the UGMRT for one full rotation cycle and at two epochs. At high frequency, the star shows only right circularly polarized ECME. But we, when we went to the lower frequencies, we found that there are both left and right circularly polarized pulse. This is the first surprise. The second surprise is when we zoom in this rotational phase region. As I said, we observed a star at two epochs in 2019 and 2020. And you can see the difference. By the way, the y-axis are in log scale. 
Here, the bright highest flux density is around 20 millisensky, whereas here it is around 200 millisensky. So there is an enhancement by an order of magnitude. And just by continuing the pulsar analogy, we decided to call it a giant pulse. So this is the first observation of a giant pulse from a magnetic L-type star. The last surprise is, is this. So here I show you the light curves, the rotational phase coverages obtained at 687 megahertz that we obtained on different days. And I would like to draw your attention to these two rotational phases. You can see this is covered on three different days. And on one of the days, you can see this very huge enhancement in flux density. Similarly, this is the similarly you can see here, which is covered on three days. So this is the first confirmed observation of radio flare from a magnetic early type star. And this is very highly circularly polarized. So this is an important, interesting observation because these stars have so stable magnetic field that the flares are really unexpected. But there are possibility that it may have a not yet discovered companion. And uh, we do not know yet. We are going to investigate more about it. And there is another possibility, which is that this flare could be an indicator of the episodic ejection of magnetically confined plasma. This phenomena, which is named as centrifugal breakout, it has been proposed long back, long back, but its nature has been confirmed only recently in 2020. So this is the future direction. As I said, ECME is really a promising probe for stellar magnetosphere, but we must characterize properties first. And we really need more and more wideband observation, especially at lower radio frequencies, because it seems like that even for the probably the most well-known main sequence pulsar, which is C virginis, we still have new things, many more new things to know. So I, with that, I would like to finish. And here is the summary. Thank you. Thank you, Benali. That was uh, very interesting uh, stuff there with uh, your main sequence pulsars. Um, have we got any questions online for Benali or in the Q&A session? No questions online? Oh, no, oh, hang on. I think we've got some questions. I will uh, allow Sander to talk and you just have to unmute yourself, Sander. Okay. Um, yes, I, a very interesting talk. So one thing uh, I found interesting is the diffraction and that you get a different rate there. We see also an effect like that in fast radio bursts where we measure a delay in uh, something like uh, a delay rate per megahertz. Is, is that the kind of effect you see um, in these, uh, these stars as well? Uh Actually, I did not get the question. Are you talk, uh, asking about the lag that I showed? Yes, yeah, so the lag. So is the lag something like uh, seconds per megahertz that you see the lag in? Is oh, it a okay. linear slope, more or less? Okay, just, just a minute, sorry. So the lags are because these are the rotation periods are of the order of days. So they are in more, I mean, they are, you can see the slopes here. The, these are in rotational phases and the star has a rotation period of half a day. So it will be much higher than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know what- Okay, to say. cool. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, you guys can follow that off offline as well if it's not clear. Uh, thank you, Sander, for asking the question. Anyone else got any other questions? I have uh, one briefly, Benali. Um, with uh, your, what are you proposing? So you propose potentially the premise of a companion for CU Virginis, I think it was at the end there, uh, at the low yeah. frequency. Um, yeah. The alternative is Harish raised is that you have uh, the breakdown of co-rotation driving the e uh, ECMI. Have you correlated your burst with say the potential, if, if I'm sure probably the rotation rate, uh, rate of CU Ver is known. Have you looked into where those bursts correlate? So actually it's kind of a new result we have. There are two possibilities of so the things that we are planning to do is probably a high resolution observation like using VLBA or so. And the other possibility, so for that we are going to search for more of these pulses, but the co-rotation breakdown like uh, that people have mentioned in other talks, that is something we have to, we are planning to consider but not yet done. Yeah, cool. Because if it happens continually at the same rotational uh, period, I think that's really strong evidence that it's uh, driven by a breakdown of co-rotation. If you find that the uh, emission doesn't correlate with the uh, rotation period of the of the star, then that's strong evidence for something else driving it, such as Companion. So okay. that would be interesting. Yeah. To do. Yeah. All right. Thank you for your talk. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, last talk for the session uh, is now by uh, Pedro. Uh, I'll just ask Pedro to start sharing his screen and unmuting himself and if he feels comfortable uh, showing himself on camera, but you don't have to if you, if you don't feel pleasant. Yeah, <laughs> it's early morning for Pedro. I believe you're still on the east coast of the US, are you? Yeah, that's right. So, All right, well, welcome. Thank you for taking the effort to give uh, this presentation live. I really appreciate it. Um, early morning for you. All right, mm -hmm. uh, Pedro is based at, uh, at Green Bank Observatory and uh, take us away. You're going to talk about radio recombination lines. Yeah, thanks to Joe and thanks for the uh, SOC for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Um, yep, yeah, I'm Pedro Salas, a postdoc at the Green Bank Observatory. And today I would like to share with you some of the work we have been doing in the study of radio recombination lines from Cygnus X. I'm um, going to talk about uh, about the ISM in our galaxy. So just uh, a quick reminder about what the ISM is. It's uh, basically the fuel for star formation in a galaxy. It's what keeps uh, star formation going and also fits uh, the AGNs uh, in some other galaxies. Um, and basically what happens in the ISM is you have dust and gas, it uh, compresses, the, its density gets high enough that you get star, star formation. And once the stars uh, ignite, they start ionizing their surroundings and uh, influencing their surroundings through winds and supernovae, what's known as stellar feedback. And this whole process of ionization and feedback uh, shapes the structure of the ISM, giving rise to different phases like uh, ionized gas and cold neutral gas and warm gas. And once the stars end up, end up their lives or during their lifetimes through stellar winds, they enrich the ISM, which then in turn allows it to cool more efficiently and ultimately uh, trigger uh, another round of star formation. Um, so th this is very cartoonishly depicted in this uh, image here. So some of the things we would like to know about the ISM, which we are hoping we will be able to answer using uh, low frequency recombination lines are, what are the properties of the ionized and the neutral gas in, our, in the galactic plane? In particular, whether it's the temperature, the density and the pressure of this gas. We would like to understand how the feedback processes uh, influence the properties of this gas, how they set up the phase structure, like, uh, and particularly how they influence uh, the amounts of different uh, ISM constituents, like how uh, if you have a vigorous star, star formation, how does that impact the amount of cold gas you have available for star formation, and how does this uh, influences, for example, uh, the properties of the ionized gas as well and how this ionized gas can be separated um, or how it is related to the molecular clouds. Uh, is the ionized gas, for example, just uh, something really diffuse that's uh, not, not related to molecular clouds or is it photoevaporation from these molecular clouds as they are being eroded by the stars? Um, the way we're doing this is using radio recombination lines. These come in two flavors. The first one is hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen has ionization potential of 13.6 electron volts. So these lines uh, typically trace a fully ionized gas in what we know as H2 regions or the warm ionized medium. Uh, in some other cases, we have observed them uh, tracing only partially ionized gas, meaning that most of the hydrogen is either atomic or molecular, but there is enough ionized gas that we uh, are able to observe uh, hydrogen recombination lines. And the fact that the, the ionization potential is 13.6 uh, means that these are great sources of uh, great probes of stellar feedback because uh, massive stars give uh, enough uh, high energy photons that they can ionize this uh, hydrogen. And in the cases where we detect only partially ionized uh, gas, uh, we believe that the main source of ionization in this case is cosmic ray ionization. Here I'm showing one example by Kimberly Emig uh, of this uh, uh, 
uh, hydrogen lines coming from partially ionized gas, shown here on the bottom left. You can see this hydrogen line at uh, roughly 100, uh, sorry, uh, roughly 50 megahertz observed with the uh, lower LVA. And you can see that the line is quite narrow if you uh, are familiar with H, uh, with hydrogen recombination lines from H2 regions, they're typically 20 kilometers per second. This one is only a few kilometers per second, which immediately tells us that this is coming from cold gas. If we do the modeling of the line as a function of principal quantum number of frequency, um, lower frequencies correspond to higher principal quantum numbers. So this line we see here, it's this point here. If we do the full modeling, we see that indeed this corresponds to gas at roughly 40 Kelvin. And in these conditions, uh, we do not expect photoionization to play a significant role. So uh, that's why we believe that um, cosmic reionization is responsible for uh, keeping hydrogen ionized in these regions. The other flavor we have is uh, carbon radio recombination lines. And this, uh, since carbon has a lower ionization potential, these lines typically trace colder neutral gas uh, in our galaxy. Um, and uh, this makes them uh, great tools to study molecular cloud formation. Since they are tracing the, uh, the coldest layers of the uh, where carbon is ionized, which is exactly where one expects the transition between atomic and molecular uh, to take place. And some of the interesting things we can do with these lines is, for example, we can derive uh, gas properties, uh, modeling the line intensity as a function of frequency and map the gas physical properties, in this case, the electron density. Um, we can also study how the gas is stratified uh, uh, spatially. That's shown here on the top left, where we show uh, the distribution of different gas tracers as a function of distance. In this case, the rec carbon recombination lines are here in red and yellow. And we can see that they're clearly offset from, from the molecular gas. And from this, we know that they are mainly tracing the envelopes of the mo of molecular clouds. And here on the bottom, we can also see that by mapping these lines, we are able to see how the neutral gas is reacting to the presence of massive stars. In this image here, uh, we're showing observations towards the Orion A star forming region in our galaxy, where these yellow stars um, show the location of the trapezium, which is responsible for uh, powering the H2 region, uh, shown roughly in blue. And we see how the neutral gas, shown here in white contours and the red background, is basically uh, avoiding to some degree the, the ionizing stars, since these are blowing a cavity around them. So saying that, I'll turn my attention to, to Cygnus, which is a region of massive star formation in our galaxy. It is highly obscured, and it harbors a, a reservoir of molecular gas of roughly 10 to the 6 solar masses. And there are multiple uh, OB associations in this uh, case, in this region. Um, here, uh, I'm showing LOFAR HBA observations of uh, a small portion of uh, the region where we see uh, Cygnus OV2, which has a mass of roughly 10 to 4 solar masses in stars. And we can see also uh, numerous other regions of star formation uh, marked with uh, stars and numbers. So the presence of all this massive star formation, as well as some supernova remnants, makes this region an ideal laboratory to study the effects of stellar feedback. And what we're aiming to do uh, is uh, use radio combination lines to understand this better. And we're doing this using LOFAR and the GVD. The idea is to map these regions uh, shown here on the right. In blue, it's the footprint of the region we have uh, proposed to map with the GVD, and in black, the observations we have conducted with the HPA of LOFAR. Observations will cover uh, between 150 and 800 megahertz uh, with spatial resolutions between 32 arcminutes and 10 arcminutes with a spe spectral resolution of two kilometers per second. Um, 
having these observations as well as auxiliary data, it will be we will be able to really model the the line properties and be able to differentiate between uh, denser ionized gas or more diffuse uh, ionized gas. And some of the science questions uh, we want to answer with this uh, with this study is what are the properties of the gas, how this uh, ionized gas is related to the to other phases of the ISM we mentioned before, and uh, more and something that's really interesting that we can do with uh, spectral lines, of course, is uh, study the kinematics of the gas, try to understand how the turbulence uh, is transmitted between different phases of the ISM. Um, and uh, once we have the physical properties of the gas, we can also measure the pressure and try to uh, understand which modes of feedback are most uh, important uh, in this region. Here I'm showing an example from the work from, from Laura Lopez, where she studied uh, uh, 30 door in the large Magellanic cloud, where she uh, compared the pressure fr from uh, direct from the radiation from the stars, as well as the pressure in the dust and the H2 region and in the stellar winds to try to determine which was the most important uh, mode of stellar feedback. So we're hoping to conduct uh, similar kinds of a similar kind of study, but also incorporating the kinematics and uh, all the all the details we can learn from uh, radio recombination lines. So today I will present uh, some of the the LOFAR observations we have. These have, were performed using the using the tidal array from LOFAR using six uh, innermost core stations. Uh, which act, uh, which are combined uh, in phase to form the tide array, very similar to what a single dish does. And the observations were separated into four hour blocks and uh, the spatial resolution in this case is 10 minutes and uh, two kilometers per second spectral resolution. Here in the background, you can see uh, an image at 1.4 gigahertz of the radio continuum and the footprint of the LOFAR observations, which includes uh, here the R21, SIGO V2, and the supernova remnant gamma Cygni. So this is how the hydrogen radio combination line looks. And the first thing that uh, is really striking is that we see emission almost everywhere in the region. Um, all, the, all the colored regions are showing emission in this case. And we see that the lines are more are brighter towards the R21 uh, down here and that basically this is like a screen covering the whole region um, and I'll come back to this a bit later but this is basically telling us that what we're detecting here it's really like a very diffuse component that uh, is not uh, associated with any of the particular uh, smaller H2 regions. When we look at carbon, the situation is quite similar. We also see emission in uh, almost everywhere in the region, but we see a clear offset in velocity from hydrogen. That's because the two lines are tracing different volumes of gas. And we also see some more structure than with hydrogen. See, for example, this very bright spot of emission up here, that's the tip of the supernova remnant gamma Cygni. And we're still not 100% sure why the emission is so bright towards this region. But uh, one likely explanation is that a stimulated emission is playing an important role here. Or it could also be just a chance alignment of uh, different filaments that create a uh, uh, that create an enhanced uh, 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 that enhance the emission towards this region. We also see that Two the R21. Mm -hmm, Two thank you. Yep. We also see this region here, the R21, which is quite bright, and some uh, structures. So, in terms of the spectra, here I'm showing in the spectra towards four. Uh, um, different regions. 
DR4, which is the supernova remnant, DR5, which is one of the uh, dust filaments observed in this region, DR29, which is one of the uh, a compact region of star formation, as well as DR21. And on the top, I'm showing uh, tracers of neutral gas, and on the bottom, tracers of ionized gas. And just two things to point out here. Um, whenever we see the, the carbon recombination lines, we see that they agree somewhat well with these dips in the hydrogen line profile shown in light blue. And this is mainly hydrogen self-absorption, so dense pockets of cold neutral gas, uh, which uh, confirms that carbon is tracing this, uh, this cold, cold dense gas. But it makes it much easier to study since we don't have to decompose uh, the self-absorption profiles from the emission profiles. And in terms of the ionized uh, gas, we see that the low frequency recombination lines are tracing something quite different from the uh, higher frequency recombination lines, which again uh, is mainly because we're not tracing individual H2 regions, which is shown here. Uh, we have H alpha, the hydrogen 166 alpha line at 1.4 gigahertz, which is clearly tracing the H2 regions uh, that were signal sex and the hydrogen 351 alpha, which is uh, basically tracing the whole ionized gas in the region. We can see that the line is significantly narrower than H alpha and the higher frequency recombination lines. And also very interestingly, we are not uh, affected by, ext by extinction. So we can uh, study the ionized gas throughout the region and uh, in the galactic plane very well, which is uh, quite important because H alpha is which is the most important tracer of this gas, is a highly extinct the galactic plane. Uh, in terms of the line profile of hydrogen, we see that we have um, narrow line profiles. They are narrower than at higher frequencies. This implies that the temperature is somewhat lower than the canonical H2 region temperature. And density is of the order of less than 10 particles per cubic centimeter. So again, this is uh, more diffuse than than the typical than uh, compact H2 regions. So um, uh, we have completed the we have the LOFAR observations. We're still waiting for the GVD observations, which will be carried out next year this uh, during the winter. And once we have those observations, we're aiming to model the line emission and determine the gas properties. And with this. Uh, compare against what the models predict for an H2 region of these characteristics, and also trying to expand into other regions. And I'm just going to leave the summary up here and answer any questions if there are. All right, thank you, Pedro. Uh, very interesting talk. I was wondering if anyone online had a question for Pedro. No, it was all very clear. Um, I, I had a, a very brief and, and probably silly question. Um, with these, uh, these, these radio recombination lines towards uh, these H2 regions, um, have you seen any evidence for this like kind of warm ionized uh, ISM? Uh, do you, are you just, you don't have the density to see the ISM as well? Or is there any evidence for that in your lines? Um, when we look at the, at the line profiles and when we decompose them, and oh, that's better shown here. Yeah, we don't seem to be tracing the, the H2 regions at all. When we look at at some of the, the examples, there could be hints of, uh, of well, if you look at the line profiles, they're yeah. clearly two velocity components. We have this narrower guy mm -hmm. here and a slightly broader guy here. This broader guy could be somewhat associated to the H2 regions uh, due to the, the similarity in velocity, but um, it's not really clear that, uh, I mean, the thing with hydrogen lines is that they're very sense, they change a lot uh, with frequency. So as, as soon as you move a little bit in frequency, you start tracing uh, slightly different things. And the jump here between 1.4 gigahertz and 150 megahertz is large enough that you would be really tracing the very outer layers of the H2 regions where the gas is. Okay, very interesting. Significantly. Yeah. 
All right. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, I think we'll end it there because we finish on time as well. So uh, thank you for, again, getting up early for us. And so that kind of concludes our very first session on radio stars and transients. For